period, robbery rates have been, in general, flat since uh, the beginning of the current century. There is a measure I'm calling uh, consumer pessimism. This is now the Consumer Sentiment Index, but I've turned it, turned it on its head. Consumer Sentiment, sentiment Index uh, indicates that higher values on the, indi uh, on the index uh, correspond with optimism. Lower values correspond with a person's pessimism about their economic circumstances. What I've done is just turn that around so that higher values on the index now, the pessimism index I'm suggesting, represent more pessimism. And I think crudely one could argue that, you know, as you look over time and you see crime increases, they tend to correspond with increases in pessimism. We see it again here. We see the decline in pessimism during the economic expansion of the 90s, the crime decline of the 90s, and then we see an increase in pessimism and a flattening of the uh, robbery rate, though we don't see a corresponding increase. And here, in the year 2008, the beginning rumblings of our current recession, we see a sharp rise in pessimism. This rise in pessimism occurred in the <coughs> third quarter of 2001. Why would you have expected so the Consumer Sentiment Index is reflecting people's economic circumstances, reflecting their perceptions, but when extraordinary, let's call them exogenous shocks occur, like the 9-11 attacks, that too increases pessimism. But pessimism stayed relatively high, and that's because in the early part of the current century, we were in a recession. Now, Let's, I want to take these curves apart. One of the things you notice about these two curves is that this one tends to have this strong, uh, in statistical terms, it's, it's a quadratic. In fact, I fit a quadratic curve to have that curve. If you ignore year-to-year -year changes, the deviations from this best-fitting curve, what you see is a run-up through, what, mid-80s up to about 1990 and then decline. We don't see as significant a trend in changes in the pessimism index. What do you imagine is the chief factor responsible for this overall trend in robbery rates? There is a single factor, and uh, it's important, and it helps to explain this overall change over a half century. Baby I'm sorry? The age of baby boomers? Yeah. It's the aging of the population. The baby boomer generation, that huge 75 million strong cohort uh, that um, began being born in the years immediately after World War II, they ended their crime prone years in the 1960s and early 70s, but then they moved into uh, uh, ages in which crime is less frequent, they are replaced by smaller cohorts in the 80s and we see crime rates level off and then begin to decline. We don't see that same curve in the case of pessimism because pessimism isn't driven by age composition changes to the same degree. What I want to suggest is that what economic conditions help us to explain not necessarily this long-term change, though they may have some relationship to it, but the year-to-year -year deviations from that change. So what I've done, what I did, was simply remove this trend statistically, these, these longer-term trends. Now, I didn't have to do much here because there is not much of a trend, but here I removed it statistically. I took the trend out. And what I'm going to show you now is the relationship between changes in consumer sentiment and robbery rates after these long-term trends have been removed. And as you can see, there's a pretty close correspondence between year-to-year -year changes in pessimism and year-to-year -year changes in robbery. 
Uh, it's certainly not a perfect relationship, but it's a reasonably strong correlation, and we see uh, a fairly close relationship over time between changes in robbery and, you know, putting it simply, the business cycle. Uh, here, however, we see a marked increase in pessimism that's not necessarily matched by a marked increase in crime. And we'll get to that in a moment. So year-to-year -year changes in crime, I'm suggesting, are related to year-to-year -year changes, cyclical changes, if you will, in economic conditions. And what is true for robbery is also true for burglary and uh, also true for motor vehicle theft, also true for larceny, which is theft not accompanied by force, shoplifting, for example. Uh, and I want to also propose, it's also true for violent crime, including homicide. Uh, now, before I go on, the question that should be emerging is, yeah, well, why would the economy be linked to changes in crime? And here's the reason that I think doesn't apply. It is not the case, and this is plain, uh, simply, uh, based on your own experience and your own observations of the experience of those around you. The, autonomy, the economy uh, has turned down in the past, it's currently turned down. Most people, the vast majority of people, don't begin committing crimes in order to replace the incomes they may have lost through unemployment or lower wages. That does happen at the margin, but that kind of effect is, uh, applies to a very small segment of the population. There's another way in which, and I think a more uh, important mechanism for explaining that, relation, that relationship between cyclical economic change and robbery rate changes we saw just a moment ago, there's a more important mechanism linking those two. Think about what happens when uh, the economy turns down. All we have to assume on the part, I know there's some psychology students here, and you tend to be focused on variations in individual behavior, characteristics of individuals that make them more or less likely to engage in crime, for example. All we have to assume is that people who are uh, inclined to commit crime, like other people, respond to incentives, right? Even people who are badly damaged psychologically are still capable of responding to incentives. Somebody in one of the many earlier talks <laughs> today suggested that in England, uh, 